take one for the team. No. <laughs> no, you don't. How to hunt.com. How to cross a river. <laughs> How to keep the boots dry at how to hunt.com. And I'll try not to hey, what your old guy. <laughs> <laughs> Cold. Well, I guess I'm not going to go up too much higher now because I discovered that the frickin' GoPro cameras lose their juice while they sit dormant in the cold in your pickup truck in your pack. So now, I don't have any juice in my GoPros <laughs> to... Uh, send down the river on my filming thing. That kind of kills what I wanted to get done today. Damn it. There's always something there, right? Always something. When it comes to filming, and videotaping, doesn't matter where, what, and all you people that do it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's always something. <laughs> always. You either forget the adapter for the tripod, forget the spare battery, think you charge your batteries, put a dead battery in the camera by accident before you left to go to the middle of nowhere for the day. It's always something. Forgot spare batteries, forgot the SD card, forgot to clear the SD card. You can't delete the content that's on the SD card because it's not on the computer yet. It's endless. It is what it is though. So it just does make it that much sweeter when you score and create some wicked content. It's fun, fun and frustrating. <laughs> I can imagine what the true, true adventurers do. The guys that gotta lug thousands of pounds of gear into the Amazon or the Arctic, whether it be the South, South Pole, the North Pole, whatever. The amount of shit that goes on with the gear is amazing. You gotta have lots of backup, usually I do, but try a little rant for the day. It's funny, quick mention on something I mentioned earlier. Somebody asked me why, how I could shit on Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> well, the reality of it is, you know, when you live your life bullshit free and then sometimes dive into the media world and see what's going on, your bullshit meter goes red lines in about the first three seconds to turn that idiot box on. And as an example of why I don't have any respect for late night television hosts is number one, I would possibly bet my life that every one, single one of them has had a talking to on what they can or can't say and what they have to say in positions they must take in front of that camera. And as far as I'm concerned, it's just my opinion, anybody who does relent to that is a coward and or a liar. But anyway, um, you know, as far as political sides go, Canadian, American, North American, anyone, any political side in the world, my entire life is if I possibly believe A should be elected and I might cast my vote for A and I have a good friend or a relative that's full on B, supporting B to elect them, all right, so be it. I don't care. Does it make me angry? No. I'll still go fishing with them. I'll have a beer with them. I'll fight to the death for them. My friend, family, who gives a shit? I don't care. It is what it is. The majority's gonna, the majority's gonna decide anyway. But when you have a platform that can potentially successfully manipulate the planet and you use that platform to cause divide with a real big effort and you knowingly cause divide, hatred and anger non-stop every chance you get in front of that camera, which many of those late night television hosts did. I don't watch them. I've had I've watched enough of them to stomach, and then that's it. I'm done. I don't waste time with them. But I don't care whose side it is or whose side 
you're talking about, I'm not talking about sides. What I'm talking about is the fact that numerous late night television hosts who have substantial followings use that platform to deliver hate and divide to the people in their communities, in their society, in their country. And that is that should be punishable by by jail, as far as I'm concerned, all right? And that's why I will make the odd comment about them and the way I feel about them is they are garbage human beings with no use to society. Prove me I'm wrong. What would a good potential good late night late night TV show host, what would they how would they gain my respect or me see them as worthy of time or or good? Would be if they deliver comedy, made the people laugh, which was their original intent. Make people laugh, make people feel good about themselves, treat people equally. And whoever it is that gets elected by the majority of a vote in any country, their demeanor should be, all right, the election's over. Let's all band together and help this new person who's been elected do the best they can for all of us together as a whole, and let's rock this shit out. It's not hard, is it? When I've seen the majority of the late night television hosts go the exact opposite the entire time, even after elections, to insist on nonstop creating hatred and divide amongst the people. Easily proven. Easily proven. Onward. Let's get something shared. Gotta love these little rants lately, right? Obviously, my wheels have been turning. I was stuffed in front of the TV. Unfortunately, dear Steve, my wife and I love your program. Keep up the good work. I had something happen as a teenager. We had a cabin in the Allegheny National Forest, Pennsylvania. It was the last place I thought an encounter would happen. It was somewhere around 1975. It was summer, and we were fishing dark until midnight. Nope, I already read that. Darn it. All right, what's this one? Well, I hope you read. Okay, I'm reading it. Dear Steve, I'm not a great writer, but I'm going to try. I'm from West Virginia. I heard a story you read about a Norwegian woman. She had mentioned a silence that she said she felt like being in an airplane. I know this feeling. I felt it once extremely strong when I toured the Moundville prison. Myself and my cousin, who happens to be a corrections officer, knew the tour guide, so on a whim we went. We got to the North Hall where the death row inmates had been held. We listened to Mary tell her scary ghost-type stories and had a really good time. I felt my ears clog. It was really odd. I started talking loudly, trying to hear myself talk. Nobody else felt this. That feeling stayed with me like my ears were under some kind of pressure. We left Moundsville, and I complained to my cousin about how I was feeling. I didn't get it. thought about allergies. Old place? I don't know. When we got to New Martinsville, about 20 minutes away, heading home, it finally lifted. That's how it felt. Lifted. So much better. Odd, but oh well. Later, I was watching a show about kids with psychic abilities. One boy said to chip coffee that he sees demons by pressure in his ears. And I went, I went, oh crap, that's what it was. I now believe that is how we can be aware of supernatural things, being spirits. I learned from this experience that I can feel them too. I think it tried to follow me home. It was sent away because I'm a believer in God and Jesus Christ. If you or anyone feels this or maybe they can sense another way simply ask Jesus for help although at the time I hadn't put that together he still helped me out thanks to him it's a bad thing the time is coming we need to be aware of these do exist in many forms tangible bearings the spiritual ones know you have the power to command them in Jesus name there is a spiritual war coming get right with God we need this shield protection please be safe I love what you stand for I believe we are lied to to keep us under control as a team we're invincible. But separate the spiritual negatives, have control of the people who makes the rules, fight back with prayer. Prayer is powerful, I use it all the time. I hope you get to read this. Really do admire your tenacity. Nikki, An A Nikki Anderson. You can use my name if this finds you. I'm a fan. Lucky Sarah. <laughs> Alright, thanks Nikki, I appreciate that. And uh, I don't envy having that weird feeling, especially in a dark, a dark prison. What an odd place to get a tour of. Probably not much good went on in one of those, right? Let's 
so it's what is it right now? It's March 10th or something like that. It's getting warm out. And the big bears are probably coming out of the holes now. The boars come out first, the males. And uh, you wouldn't believe how high up they, they den up. They den up so high, it just absolutely blew my mind the first time I saw it firsthand in Alaska. And the, the big males, the big boars, they come out of the holes first and start going on tour and looking for something to eat. They follow their nose wherever it leads it. They follow their nose early spring because there's not much vegetation up for them to graze on. And, uh, you know, the wolves and the coyotes and the other smaller predators that don't hibernate, they usually clean up all the goodies first so there's not overly too much left for them in the spring when the, when the snow melts away, right? But what, what they typically do, these big grizzly bears, and uh, the Alaskan guides were the first ones that explained this to me years ago, is they, when they come out of the hole, they march right down into the timber and they go to where the moose are wintering and they kill a moose and lay on it. Just like that, done. <laughs> and they sit there and eat that whole moose and regain their composure and health and energy, and they carry on. And then the sows come out later with their cubs, and they tend to stay a little higher away from those marauding boars who like to kill the baby cubs. And uh, what's coming? April 1st is coming. April 1st is typically open season for black bears in British Columbia and many other places in North America. Lots of people don't agree with that, but that's too bad because it's actually a healthy, sustainable thing. And they're Many, many people make delicious sausages and roasted and steaks and canned meat out of their flesh. And it's a very healthy thing and it's a healthy activity to take part in. But those guys will be coming out of their holes any day now too. And the grizzly bears hammer on those black bears and attack and kill them as well. I haven't seen any bear tracks yet, but there is some big grizzlies in this valley where I am right now. Real big. Little side note for you guys to hear. What do we got? All right. Hi, Steve. Commiserations on losing your best animal friend? They say time heals all wounds. Not so. I had a dog in the 60s, a golden spaniel, who was my best mate. I still think about him regularly. I've had no other animals since. Steve, I know this is not a Sasquatch or Yowie story, but this animal should not have existed in Australia either. It was October 66, I was 10 years old, and I went to work with my father on Saturday. He drove a water truck for a road-making crew. We drove to a place called Lang Lang, where his boss was building a cabin. He wanted my father to drag a central, be a central beam up and down a dirt road to make it look worn before being installed. It was a building site on an acreage. Down the hill from the cabin was an open paddock and a dam pond surrounded by manicured timber and tall grass line. Yahoo! I found four empty 10-gallon drums. I had a heap of scrap wood and nails. Great idea. Go down to the dam and build a raft. I dragged everything down to the dam and borrowed a hammer. We got halfway through building this creation when my young sixth sense kicked in. I stopped completely and stood up. I had a feeling of danger that I'm being stared at. I did the big circle scan. Turning around, I scanned every inch of the long grass of the tree line. Up the hill, probably 30 meters away, I noticed a circular shape in the light brown long grass line. The black circle then disappeared, then reappeared a couple meters up. My young curiosity got the better of me, thinking of what my sixth sense told me, danger. I decided to pick up a piece of the timber I was going to use. That was a two inch by two inch, approximately twice my height, maybe eight feet long. I proceeded towards the black circle. It had moved again, but I still walked towards it. My brain was screaming, boar, wombat, dog. When I got approximately two meters from the grass, I stopped and put the piece of wood in front of me. I peeked over the grass. First I heard the cat-like growl, then I saw it. It was left hand side to me, doing what I can only explain as mock charge, as it was retreating slowly away. Its tail was up in the air with a hook over its head. Its muscles were rippling, very stocky and powerful looking. I was slinking down at about half my height. It sounded very aggressive and annoyed. It turned sideways, growling. I could see one large canine. There were more, but I focused on the largest one. What was about the size of an adult's finger? Its coat was smooth and shiny with a touch of brown streaks running through it. With a thrash of its tail from side to side, it seemed to be gesturing for me to stay away, don't follow or else. It made its way deeper into the bush land until I couldn't hear or see it anymore. When I first saw this black panther creature, my body went into shock. I became paralyzed to the spot. Strange my eyes and brain, were working, but I could not move. I was still holding the timber in front of me. 
When I gained my composure, I started moving, step by step, slowly backing up all the while, thinking there are no any more. So I started scanning the tree lines back and forth with eyes that were still moving in their sockets as wide open as a terrified person can get. I felt my mouth open and I drew a big breath of air. My initial thoughts were, get out of here, but don't run. It took, it took time for my body to snap out of it. When I did start moving, I moved like a rusty robot. Full motion, back, I walked slowly down the hill backwards, scanning the lines as I went. By now holding the timber up in front of me, like I was charging across no man's land. I finally walked far enough backwards and could hear the workman. I turned and made it to the house. A painter was up a ladder outside. He looked down and said, Kid, you look like you've seen a ghost. You alright? I remember looking up at him, but my vocal box had disappeared. Only mumble came out. I was speechless. That was not me. I made my way into what was to be the living area. I sat down a pile of timber and made sure I was surrounded by the workers of the house. I don't know how long I sat there, still stunned and trying to collect my thoughts, but I can remember Dad saying, Come on, son, time to go. With that, we left. On the way home, I thought, should I say something to my father or shouldn't I? I thought he'd understand and maybe give some insight as to what happened, as I still, as I still was in denial a bit, but it wasn't as I know what I saw. I plucked up the courage and said, Today I'd seen a very aggressive black panther, big cat creature. Straight away he said, Don't be stupid, there are no panthers in the bush in Australia. The stern voice told me he was annoyed, so I let it slide, thinking to myself, What an arsehole. After that, there was no way in the world I was going to speak to anyone else about this matter, so I never did until much later in life. My psychology profile was now rewritten. Don't trust anyone and don't go into the bush. I'm 64 now and have and will never go into the bush by myself. I lost a lot of respect for my father that day. Something changed between the two of us. From then on, the father-son bonding seemed to disappear. When my wife and I had children, we took them to the zoo around 1991. We approached the big cat section. There up high, stood on a limb, looking from behind was a black panther. I stopped pushing the pram and stared at it in awe. The hooked tail went up. The snarl went out. It even had brown striping through the shiny fur. I had no doubt now that's what I saw. My wife is curious. She said, We were out on a family day to the zoo. The kids enjoyed it, but since you stopped and saw the panther, you've been acting aloof. I respected her enough, and she knows I never lie, so I told her what I saw as a kid. One day on the Today Tonight Show came a story about a big cat being sighted in the same area. Since then, with the advent of the Internet, people have come forward with the stories in a forum. As an older man, I still look back and realize that a piece of wood may have saved my life that day. This panther could have dragged me into the bush land, never to be seen again. My father is still alive, 94 this year. A couple of years ago, he said, I saw a documentary the other night. They're seeing more and more big cats in Australia. You could have been right when you were a kid. I tried to gloss it over. Yeah, whatever, I said, but my wife could see I was how annoyed I was. Steve, I am an ex-serviceman, 6 foot and 95 kilograms, who played Australian rules football. It's quite a tough and demanding game. <laughs> yeah, you guys tape your ears to your head, right? <laughs> That's a sign it's tough. I cower from no one. My wife first saw and loved that about me, as she said. I know I'm safe with you, plus she has my wicked sense of humor. She's quite surprised that my only Achilles heel is the bush. I've discussed many times with my wife what happened as many Sasquatch-related events seem similar, with their traumatic after effects on people. Love your approach to authority or people that are placed in pedestals by the masses, especially monarchy. We seem to we seem very close in our views. You can use my name, keep up the good informative work. Your Aussie mate, John Acton. Right on, John. I enjoyed that one, man. Enjoyed that share, and thanks for sending it. And hopefully, somebody from the area that, that happened um, reads that, and it helps them out, and they possibly saw the same thing you saw, right? And one thing I'm going to point out to all of you when it comes to an animal living its life without us seeing it. Years ago, I was got I guided a man, Stet Edmonds. He's a wildlife biologist that lived in Taos, 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 New Mexico. A very renowned guy. He was hired by many multi-millionaires to go work their ranches and bring up the quality of their game and, and their elk herds and stuff. And what he told me was, and this changed my hunting practices forever what he explained to me thoroughly was as we sat on that mountain you know 12 days straight one-on-one hunting all day long and bullshit very knowledgeable guy 
and he explained to me, he said, hey, Steve, he says, you know those areas where, you know, kids party in the woods and there'll be at the end of a road and there's beer bottles and clay pigeons and shotgun shells laying around and fire, fire pits and garbage and shit? I'm like, yeah. Oh, so he said to me, he says, you know what? You know, you go to places that are over hunted and tons of guys have gone there and everybody says it's all shot out and there's no game left? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, there is game left. And you will never, ever kill them all or shoot them all out, which is how they describe it. I'm like, what do you mean? And he said that in every species, there is the genetically superior one or two or few that are genetically superior. And those are the ones that repopulate after whatever happens, happens to depopulate their, the herd, whether it be overhunting or weather, whatever. But what he said was, there is always, 100% for certain, always that genetically superior one that we will not see we just don't see them they're too smart and he's just talking about elk and deer and moose and <coughs> and uh natural predators it's not talk, talking about something absolutely rare as say a large black jaguar or a panther right and uh somebody i trust in the south told me flat out they seen one of these things in tennessee south tennessee and i believe him he said he saw it he saw it and uh, there's too many accounts of these large cats being seen where they're not supposed to be. There just is. There's no way of getting out of it. So the way my brain goes is, all right, there's too much evidence. And evidence for me is eyewitness accounts from credible people, with, with especially with bush, bush experience. And if those people, those qualifications are saying it and they're not related and they're spread out around a continent or even different continents, it's going down. You could take that possibly to the bank, right? So, it'll be interesting to see if anybody else in Australia who's listening to this has had similar experiences or they know someone who has, and they can add to what this fine gentleman here shared with us today. Let's see if we get one more up here. Then I'm going to try a few casts beside me. I know these guys already ran through here, but they're not, they're going too fast. All right. There was a time a couple summers ago when my husband went out on the four-wheeler with his dog for a hunt across the road we call the gravel pits. It was the second gravel pit that my husband, Jimmy, and his dog, Chopper, seen a jumper, and our dog jumped off the quad to chase it. When he looked for him, he couldn't find him. He came back home and got me, Kathy, and our son, Storm. It was an old ear cut where things were starting to grow we're starting to grow in trees, still pulled down with the roots and dirt still on them. There's a path we had never seen before, so Jimmy and Storm were walking down the trail, which led down to the river, and asked me to stay at the top where the clear cut was in case their dog came up around there. But anyways, we were yelling back and forth to make sure we knew where everyone was, and it was about 10 minutes in. No periods again, you guys. No frickin' periods. Ah. I started feeling a weird feeling of like being watched, so I kept looking around and I yelled for my husband, but he never answered, then called for my son, still nothing. I wasn't sure about going in. Like I said, I got a weird feeling. I was scared, so I stayed where I was, but I still couldn't hear anything. And out, if nowhere, I smelled something rank, real rank. I looked around one more time, and I happened to look far to my right, where the trees were down, and I seen a glare. And as I seen this glare, something big black stood up. I stared shaking. It's like I couldn't speak to yell for my husband. And all this time I kept looking around and I thought that when this big black creature stood up, I swear it was a fallen down tree with the dirt roots on the end, but it wasn't. But anyways, this creature stood up and looked at me, turned to his side and took one step. And his next step, he was into the bush already. I was shaking. It seemed like it took forever when I seen this thing, it was like maybe five seconds. I didn't know what to do, where to go. I was scared to move. And all of a sudden I heard sticks break. And my husband and son came walking back up the trail and they said they smelled something foul and thought maybe a bear. So I didn't want to run into him. And he said, let's go in another spot. So I told him what happened. He wanted to go look for a track, but I was too scared and I didn't want to be there. No more. So about 10 minutes after moving, we ran into the rangers and they helped us look for him. 
We found and went home to this day. I'm still scared to go by there. I don't like stopped there. This has happened more than once. We're at the same gravel pits. This one was at the third. My husband and son, my husband's cousin, was going to get out and check rabbit trails. Something yelled out at them. They got scared, jumped in the truck, said, after this, we're gone. Didn't want to stick around to see what was going to come out. Another time we were camping where my brother-in-law took us by Grand Rapids. Something threw a stick at the truck we were sleeping in. The stick was still standing there and we got up. My husband never told me till morning. He knew I wouldn't be able to sleep. I don't know why this always happens to us. My husband says we're in the bush too much, but I don't know. But anyways, I was told about there at Grand Rapids is where people went and did some research about Bigfoot. There's a lot of caves in that area, and they found out there are a lot of Bigfoot there. I don't know if I would have camped there. There is knowing, so I guess it's good. I never knew, but thanks for hearing me out in my three stories. You can read this if you like. Whew, made it. Pressed through another one without any punctuation. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that, Calpy. I don't know how you recorded that on here. I've heard a lot of people saying it's voice to text or something like that, which I don't know anything about. I've never done. But it sucks. But aside from that sucking, your story doesn't. Thanks for sharing it. And I'm sure possibly somebody from that area has had the same experiences, just read what you shared too, and it might be taking a little bit of weight off their chest, right? It's no ending. It's never, never, never ending. Never, ever. Ending. Steve, I grew up in South Georgia, in the woods and swamps, hunting and hanging daily. Fast forward 20 years, I'm on my lease hunting property near Whitmore, South Carolina. I found it strange that the old guys in the club would always never hunt here alone. These woods are different. I laughed to myself. I normally carry a 30 odd six. Here we go. Getting late, 20 minutes. 20 minutes maybe before dark, I watched some small pines sitting over a road into tall pines, maybe 20 from in, probably feet in, 20 feet in. I'm in my climber, maybe 10 feet or so. I love the woods, I hate heights. Woods are loud and then quiet. Okay, I thought, boy, it has to show up. Just hoping for a big buck. Next thing I hear someone walking towards me in the small pines, then it just stops. It's getting really dark. I normally don't need a light. Gravel road just up the hill. Well, I start hearing deep groans where the walking steps stopped. I'm like, oh, maybe a bear or a cat, which would be very uncommon in this area. Maybe cats, but bears down this far normally no. Quiet again. I can see the small road well in the moonlight has, that has risen. I never realized how much time was passing. In the pines where I'm in my stand is very dark and the next thing I hear are the grounds immediately under, under me, almost like beside me. There was a smell that was a bit overwhelming, but just like a dead animal in the woods. I was like, there's a stinky animal climbing in my tree. And I felt like I was going to be grabbed. I started moving a good bit, trying to get my gun pointed down and lifted my feet. I've been shaking in the woods before, wild pigs and dogs. I was freaking scared. I heard a sound. I heard a sound like you are jumping to the ground. Oh, I heard a sound like you're jumping to the ground. Then quiet. But I could hear heavy breaths. I started yelling down. If you're a club member trespassing, I don't care. Just identify yourself. You're going to freaking start shooting the shadows. Sorry, uncalled for it, but I thought someone was trying to get at me in my tree stand. I never heard another sound, and that twang I caught a whiff of was gone. I sat for who knows how, thinking, what just happened? Well, I'll tell you, this sucks. I put my gun on my back and started clicking down the tree slowly. No more than two or three clicks down the tree, I smelled it again. I heard a low groan. The sound as it was right in front of my face. No light, saw nothing, but it scared me so bad, I stood up and jumped into the dark in the other direction. When I hit the ground and rolled around, I jumped and ran to the road that goes between the two pine sections. And I ran hard as you could, to the gravel road where I could see well in the moonlight. As this time I remember my buddy was down at the bottom of the road in the small pines where I put him in a big box stand and I haven't seen his light or heard nothing from him. So I had to run down that road that I was just sitting on to get by the bottom of the rivers, three rivers, down there to where he was at. 
Well, he was coming up the road very slow when I ran up on him. He said, Doug, man, there's some weird shit going on down. We need to go now. We walked together slowly back up the gravel road. I heard someone walking on both sides of us all the way to the gravel. I think he was hearing it too. We did not speak for the whole walk, maybe five to six hundred yards. For some reason, I didn't feel my gun was going to help. I had hollered earlier, threatening to shoot, and whoever this is, they weren't scared and I couldn't see. When we got to the gravel road, nothing. The whole atmosphere changed and it was almost 11 o'clock at night. Wow, dark at six. Shit. Me and my buddy didn't talk much. Went back to camp, had some food, went to sleep, actually to bed. I could hear him rolling around all night and I didn't sleep a wink. Sorry, hit send. It wasn't quite there. Okay, here's the second part. You got to email, email it to me. The next morning, of course, no one wanted to hunt. It was a lot colder than normal this week in the woods, so it was a good excuse. After we ate breakfast down to the rivers, I just wanted to look around to see if I could find tracks anywhere or anything. And we did find some tracks on the banks of the Saluda River. They were bigger than my boots. I can picture in my mind right now how white my friend's face got, and boy, I wish I could have had a camera. I'm not sure what was in those woods, but I've never experienced anything like that, and my buddy will not even acknowledge that any of this happened. My name is Doug, and I won't ever forget it. People made good fun back in the day when I told them about it, so I thought I'd drop you a line after finding a website. Thanks and be blessed. Doug, thank you for taking your time out to type that out, share it with all the people here, man. Really appreciate that. And uh, obviously, you've been watching this channel now. You know that literally hundreds of people have had that exact same experience. And that's not a good one. I don't think I've had the... I haven't had anything paralleling me in the timber yet. Making it blatantly, blatant obvious that it has two feet and it's paralleling me. I haven't had that happen yet. I've had a pile of other shit happen though. I don't envy people that have had that happen, that's for sure. But they never harmed you, right? So, what do you do? And I'm imagining all the old school boys at the club... If any of those guys went missing or had an arm or a leg ripped off in the past, everybody probably would have known about it, right? So, as far as we all know so far, from what we share it is, quote, weird shit goes on in those woods. And that's about it. I'm sure there'd be a lot of people that'd be uh, curious enough to want to volunteer up their time to go hang in those woods full time to find out what it was. Not me, though. But, anyway, I think I need to give this chunk of water beside me a few goes see if there might be a steelhead lane in there for me to play with. Heard something in the timber over there while I was reading. It started to sound high-pitched. Maybe like a cow elk bark, maybe. That'd be kind of cool if it was. I'll keep the camera close by in case I can get him on camera. But anyway, share my story, howtohunt.com. Tell my story, howtohunt.com. Get it in. So you'll get to it. Oh, I'm going to share something else. So, uh, like I mentioned back a while back, they were moving. They're going to be moving, I think, in the uh, end of June, I think we're moving. And uh, it's basically the home of all homes to move into. It's not new or anything, but it's just the position. The place it is and the planet's pretty cool. There's a few, a few steelhead rivers within two minutes to 15 minutes behind the house. It's not far to go out to get out in the ocean, and it's rural, and the horses can be there. And but the, the big thing about it is though is I'm gonna build I'm gonna build the ultimate man cave. And in my man cave I'm gonna have all my all my goodies that I've accumulated over the years of running around the bush. But more importantly, I'm gonna build a perfect acoustic studio in there. And I think what we're eventually gonna start doing is we're gonna start talking to people. We're gonna start instead of just reading, I think I will see if I can create the place to do it in the right time and the ample internet connection, whatever we need, and I'm going to start talking to people and getting the truth out and exposing bullshit in the planet. I think that's going to be a very worthy project. Anyway, i got to stop babbling. i got to get fishing. <laughs>